The most important thing we can do as Christians is know Christ. Ephesians 3, 17-19 That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth, passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. As the Bible states, we are filled with the fullness of love. This is it. I could stop recording right here. If we all made God our top priority, I wouldn't need to bring this message to you. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Point number one, super busy. We're living in a day and time where life is incredibly busy. Slowing down and taking time to enjoy the great outdoors or sitting by the fireplace to read a book for an hour seemingly only happens these days on the Hallmark Channel. Why can't we slow down? And doesn't God want us to slow down? That's a big topic, one for a seasoned theologian to tackle. But suffice to say, life is hectic and there isn't any slowing down in sight. My wife and I will trade stories about this country in Europe that takes three-hour lunches, or this country in Latin America that has a three-day work week. Are there respites of relaxation out there? Maybe. Maybe just beyond our reach? Or is it just the grass is greener on the other side? We personally, as a family, might never travel far enough to find out. One thing's for sure, America, North Carolina anyways, is as busy as she's ever been. And here's the knock on busy. Being busy doesn't leave us much time to take care of ourselves. Yet at the same time, more and more evidence is emerging to show the health benefits of things like sitting down for meals, the Washington Post, January 2015, stretching and leisurely walks, Mayo Clinic, April 2013, spending quality time with children away from electronics, Psychology Today, August 2015, Keeping the cell phone and her blue glare out of the bedroom, Time Magazine, January 2014. Spending time helping others, U.S. News, April 2012. Spending time with pets, NBC News, February 2016. Doing puzzles and brain teasers, New York Times, March 2016. Expressing gratitude, University of California, Berkeley, November 2012. Hugging, U.S. News and World Report, February 2016. Laughing, San Luis Tribune, October 2015. And finally, Praying, Washington Times Reporter, Feb 2016. It seems like in the current order of this world, we are faced with holding on to a never-ending spin cycle of activities. Point number two, intervention. With work and all that goes into life, we barely get a few hours to sleep. The only way out of this cycle is intention. If we want to get time for ourselves, we have to intend for that to happen because of the cycle or routine that we've all fallen into becoming so busy. If we want to benefit from all those things I just listed, all those things that happen inherently when we slow down, we must stop and understand what's going on in this world. Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. You see, it's so much easier to just tumble in the spin cycle of life than to push back to stop it. Because when you do, some questions might emerge. Questions about who you are, what you stand for, what your purpose is, why you chose that color of paint for your kitchen, And that car to drive that you thought was great on gas but really wasn't? Questions big and small come from being still. And some lead to some pretty deep realizations. God's word is perfect. He's clearly commanding us in Psalm 46 to be still so that we can acknowledge him. And we can see all that he's created. Also so we can trust him and lean on him with the full weight of our lives. See, it takes being still to do that. 
God being the creator knew we'd need some help in this category of being still, of taking time, of doing all those things you do when you aren't in a rush anymore. So God created a place where we could come to know him through his word and through shared time, a place where we could be of service to others, a place even to laugh, hug, and yes, let those cell phones stay shut off for a few hours. That place, the local church. Part three, ignored blessing. Have you ever had a problem and gone and looked for something in the store to fix it? Just to come up with no correct solution? Have you ever come home to your closet and found the perfect solution right there? I know I have. In fact, I can't count how many times this has happened to me. Whether it's something small, like finding the perfect tape measure to use, or something big, like a rain jacket on a stormy day so I don't get soaked. Yep, I'm that guy, the one that is often seeking some complicated solution to a problem that could have been solved by looking right under my nose in my own home. That's how people treat the local church. They have all these types of problems that need solving. Many from that business I mentioned above, and plenty more from myriad of other issues life sends their way. And they look everywhere for a solution. They look at things like yoga, thinking that'll fix it, or taking a vacation, which is what I'll do my next message on, like that'll fix it, or a bottle of wine, like that'll fix it, or a book other than the Bible, like that'll fix it, or a new piece of jewelry, or the right lawyer, or the right consultant, or the, new, the best pair of shoes, or the best club to go to. They'll look at everything far and wide, sometimes literally traveling around the world just to come back to the same feelings of frustration they started with because they weren't able to fix the problem. Meanwhile, there is a building not far from your home and my home, maybe even next door. It might be big or it might not be big. It may have lots of people in it on Sunday mornings or it may just have a few. It may have a lot of one type of person, or it might be a big old mix. One thing is for sure, that building, and more importantly, the people inside, and most importantly, the one they come to worship, that's the solution to the problem. See, it's right there under our noses. Yes, the local church keeps us honest and studied up on God's word. And that's tremendously important because there's so much more to it that happens when you engage in the process. Some of the things that happen when you start going to your local church, and by local church, I mean a Bible-based church, one that puts the literal word of God at the forefront of their ministry. So here are some things that happen when you attend the local church. Fellowship, people hanging out that care about each other, not because they are any better than anyone else, but because they are lifting up God first, and that brings everyone close together. Relationships. Couples worshiping together are brought closer because, again, they are lifting God up, which happens to be the most powerful thing a marriage can ever encounter. I can attest to it. My marriage is strong because my wife and I, we worship God and put God first in our lives, and everything else falls into place. Service. Following God's command, the church serves the community, acting as mirrors of Christ. There should be no selfish motivation or hidden agenda in sight. Just helping others as Christ helped us. The feeling, the blessing you'll get from this is like nothing else in the world, I promise you. Support. Where else can you go where it's perfectly acceptable to be a grown man or woman and cry like a baby? Where people hug first and ask questions later? Where you can find biblical truths to your problems and actually have an outlet, the altar, to go and share them with God? People struggle. We all do. But in life, it's like a tough man contest. Who can endure the most pain without squinting? And in church, the local church, it's the opposite. People are there to help you when you're in need. And you are there to help them when they hit rocky waters. Calling it a family is one way to describe it. But so many people have distorted what a family means that calling it a family doesn't really do it justice. Godliness. We are made in the likeness of God. Look at Genesis 1, 26 through 27. 
and you'll find out more about that. And yet, where do we get our guidance for living our life today? CNN? Good housekeeping? Anderson Cooper? There is no other place that will show you the righteous path to follow than the local church because of what it's opening the door to, which is God's written word. Home. Our true home is in heaven with the Lord. On this earth, I believe the local church at its best is the closest thing to home here on earth. Besides maybe a good Mexican restaurant on Taco Tuesday, that might also be home, but otherwise the church. God calls us to live a certain way, act a certain way, treat others a certain way, fight battles a certain way, and so on. He's outlined detailed instructions for our lives. It's all in the Bible. And where do people get in God's word when their life is so busy? The local church. In fact, your Bible study, your, your Christian walk in life when it comes to studying God's word may be completely dependent on the local church. And if it's not, then it's absolutely enriched by it. So we're learning God's word at the church. He calls us to be apart from the worldly things, you know, lusts, temptations, and sin. What helps us shield us from the devil's fiery darts more than this place, the local church? This is where we go. Schools aren't safe anymore. Work is not safe anymore. Even home is often not safe anymore. There are sin everywhere. There's temptation everywhere. There's bad influences everywhere. There's people saying, hey, follow me. I I know what to do. I know what will make you happy. Take these 10 steps. Read this book. Take this trip. Buy this bottle of pills. The church shields us from this. And here's the sad thing. Many local churches today, you'd think they'd be doing well after what I just mentioned. You'd think they would be very prosperous for all that they offer their congregants, for all that they offer us. But no, many churches today are struggling to get by. Attendance is dwindling. Buildings are falling into despair. Pastors are forced to go back to work or close the thing down. Some even struggle to keep the lights on. And yet our creator, the creator of the universe, of everything we see on this earth, that's where he wants us to go. That's where he calls us to go. So my prayer for you today is that if you're in a church, if you're in a good local church, if what I described, you're checking off in your head like, yeah, okay, that's my church. That's that's how it is there. Then my prayer is that you get involved and that you get deeply involved and that you sacrifice because I wouldn't tell you anything that I don't do. And it's been a blessing to me. And I felt uh, like I needed to share that here so that you could. And for those that aren't in church, for those that are out of church, this is life-changing to find a good one. And I know they're not all good. And some church, some big churches are great. Some small churches are terrible. Some small churches are great. And some big churches are terrible. And everything in between. Denominations. There, are, I went to a Methodist college and enjoyed church there. I went to a Baptist church towards the end of Methodist college. I uh, helped start a, a Presbyterian church and really enjoyed that experience. Uh, involved in another Baptist church now, uh, independent Baptist church. You know what? The denomination, that can almost be put aside if you ask yourself, are they teaching the literal word of God? Are they staying true to it? Are there, is there fruits in their labor? And the Bible talks about, you'll know them by their fruits. Is there fruits in what we're doing? And if that's the case, then that's a good church. And if that's a good church, you should be there. You should be there. And the last thing I'm going to say about this before I wrap up You can make a huge impact. I always tell people when they're talking about going to church or they're thinking about being part of a church, don't underestimate the the, the impact you can have on the ministry. You know, you can have a huge impact. And so my prayer today, what I'm praying for today is that you hear this message and something just sets off in you that you want to go do this, that you want to be involved in the local church, that you want to be part of the local church, and that you're going to prayerfully consider going to one and being a, a, a active member in the church, because that's going to bring you closer to God. And friend, that's what's going to give you peace in your life. I can promise you that. Last thing I'm going to read here, 1 Corinthians 15, 
Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I really, really hope you understand what that means and what that can do for you. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and for my sins. And we must repent and come to him and follow him. And that's my prayer. It's a decision. Don't think it's not a decision. Don't think that, hey, you'll deal with it later. This is a decision. If you ignore it, then you're choosing no. And if you accept it, then you're choosing yes. And I'm praying you accept it. Father God, I pray For anyone that's listening to this, I know it's not that many people, but for those that listen to it, Lord, I pray they get something from it and they come to know you. In Jesus' holy name I pray, amen.